you know, one of the things I think that distinguishes us temperamentally, possibly, maybe because you're a little more on the liberal side and I'm a little more on the conservative side, even temperamentally speaking, mm -hmm. is that your fundamental terror is that of fundamentalism, although you also state in the moral landscape that you understand the, the, the perils of nihilism. And I would say my fundamental terror is that of nihilism, even though I'm sensitive to the catastrophes of fundamentalism. But I don't think you do address the problem of the void sufficiently, I, because I don't think that you have anything to offer except, an ex and I'm, I'm not trying to minimize your offering. You, you make a case that people should work to alleviate suffering and that we should live in truth, but Jesus, Sam, you can summarize that in two sentences. It doesn't have the yeah. potency of, well, of, the, of the fictional, literary, artistic substructure that seems necessary to make that into something that's, that's a compelling story. Well, so it's a, this is where we might disagree. This could be a fundamental disagreement. Because I, I actually, I don't see the problem of nihilism the way you do or the way it's advertised. Like it, it, once you rip out the false certainties and the bad evidence and the bad arguments and, the, and the, the mere dogmas imposed on us by prior generations, that hole never closes safely with anything else. You have to put something in its place that's shaped just like that, some other false certainty or some other story. I simply don't think that's the case. I think there's so many things we outgrow, both individually you know, if, in our own childhoods and culturally, that where th there, is no, there is no void left. There's no Santa Claus-shaped void that we have to fill with the exact but same experience, thing. But people certainly experience that Some people, void. Yeah, people I, I'm not discounting the fact that it is hard to be happy in this world. I mean, we, we are living in a world that seems designed, okay, so, perfectly designed to frustrate our efforts okay. to find permanent happiness. So you asked uh, me, you put me on the spot a while back. But let, me, let me just, yep, let me just add, add the, well, my answer to this. I yep. just think that there's the recipe for a good life, or at least, at least uh, a, a, a minimal recipe for a good life. It's not that this is all that's entailed, but this is, this, is, this is certainly necessary, if not sufficient, is to live a life that is increasingly motivated by love and guided by reason. Right? You can't go very far wrong if you are motivated by love and guided by reason. Right? And, and the problem is, is that... Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Like, well, the first thing I would say about that is, to me, that's a re recapitulation of the Judeo-Christian ethic, which is that well, you well, should be guided by love uh, and, and use logos to serve that. Except and you've got to you, you read the fine print on reason. No, yeah. well, I didn't say reason. I said logos, because that's, yeah. uh, that's something that's deeper than there's, reason. There's the Jesus smuggling yes, I was worried exactly. about. Yes, exactly. Well, yes, yes, definitely. I said it would happen. Okay, so, yeah. but, but so, look, I've been, I've been trying to, part of the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing is to try to address the void let's say, and I suspect that many of you are actually here because you would like to have the void addressed. And so the way it looks to me is something like this, and this is what I've derived in part from my studies of religious tradition. So I could say that at the beginning of Genesis, for example, there's a proposition that it's truthful speech that generates habitable order from chaotic potential. That seems to me to be the fundamental narrative, and I do believe there's something dead accurate and real about that because we do generate the world as a consequence of our communicative effort. And then there's a second proposition, which is that the world that we generate from the, the chaos of potential is habitable to the degree that the communication that we engage in is truthful. And that's why God, who uses the Logos at the beginning of time to generate the world, is able to say that his creation is good. The proposition is the world you bring into being through truthful speech is good. And that's the image of God that's implanted in man and woman. And there's a grandeur about that idea. And you think, well, you don't need the grandeur because it's just a fiction. It's like, just wait a second here. It's not just a fiction unless you don't believe that in some manner you partake in the creation of the world and that you have an ultimate responsibility that might well be described as divine to participate in that process properly, truthfully, and with love. And there's every reason to think that that's an elevated ideal so high that it's worthy of conceptualizing as divine and also to presume that it represents some fundamental metaphysical reality. 
And that's okay. a lot more powerful than you need to be good. Yes, but the problem here, Jordan, is that I, I could do exactly what you just did with Buddhism or Hinduism. And it is just as grand and just as deep and just as anchored to the, the first person experience of contemplatives who've taken that as far as they could take it. You know, people well, then monastic. I would say, Sam, you should do that and see how people respond to it. Well, no, 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 because I... Yes, because, no, seriously. No, no, because I see the end of the, end of the game. It, it's not, it doesn't arrive where I want to get to, where we need to get to, because it is, it's, it would be to different effect. It's to, it, there, there are different claims, ultimately, about the status of truth and good and evil, and about the beginning of the world and the fate of a human consciousness after death. It, it's complete, they're completely irreconcilable worldviews. You but can, I also don't you cannot think that... Square, that if, if there are Hindus in the audience, uh -huh. they believe something that is totally irreconcilable to what Christians believe. I don't think that you can offer, pardon me, a watered-down version of Buddhism as a consequence of psychedelic experience as a... As a, as a acceptable and credible that, alternative to the power of the fundamental founding myths of the Western it, culture. Yeah, and if you think not, you can, then I've you done. should it, try. It, well, no, no, I, I'm trying. Well, I'm not trying that, but that's, that's not, uh, that's not what I, well, first of all, just to, <laughs> just to get my biography straight, it's not just the psychedelic experience. I, I, <laughs> I know, I know. Yes. And I'm yes. also not making light of the psychedelic yeah. experience. Listen, to, 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 to take this, we're having most of this conversation on the side of where, wherein it seems reasonable to worry about the fate of civilization, right? You, we could have started at a very different point with just the nature of consciousness, right? Just, the, just the, for our first person encounter with being itself, right? You wake, we, all of us wake up each morning, we, we, we are thrust from a condition of deep sleep, which we seem to know nothing about, and we're just going to push through a veil of dreams into this apparently solid reality that we call the world, and we're engaging one another in this space of, of just consciousness and its contents, and we're trying to make sense of it. And science is the best language game we play, I would argue, in trying to make truly rigorous sense of it. But it's not, it doesn't exhaust all the language games we play. We play others that are, are, are also fact-based. We talk about what happened historically before we arrived here. We talk about uh, uh, facts as we can understand them that we just didn't witness, but others did, and we call that journalism, right? So we ha we're trying to have a fact-based discussion. We used to discussion. call that journalism. We, yes, yes, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's getting harder and harder to discern what's actually going on now. But we are, we are thrust into this condition of being our apparent selves, moment by moment, and we notice the difference between happiness and suffering, right? And this is not merely sensory, it's not merely that, you know, I don't, I don't like the, the, the feeling of a hot stove and I do like a, a, a warm bath. It's ideas, the ways of thinking about ourselves and the world can, can open the door or close the door to various states of happiness and suffering. And religion comes into, religion leverages that. People, the, the difference between believing that your dead child is in heaven with Jesus and not being able to believe that is enormous.